I'd like to draw your attention to a passage in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. And it's this verse. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Of all the scripture verses in the Bible, this has got to be one of the most stunning passages. How can anybody think of God as foolish? He's the creator. He created everything that there is. Nothing foolish about heaven and earth. There's nothing foolish about the laws of nature, chemistry, and biology. And Yet the Bible says, Paul writes, the foolishness of God. Now, you, now you might think of it this way. Well, well, on God's worst day, he's better than on man's best day. Now, that's possible, but it's not possible for God to have a worse day. The foolishness. When I went to school, I learned the basic things like you learned. You learned that two plus two equals four because they try to teach us logic. They want to teach us how to think. So fire is hot, water is wet, rocks are hard. And so we face life trying to understand logically how things work. And, and, and that's a good thing because God gave us a mind and it's a terrible thing to waste the mind that God has given us. But there are things, there are things, things about the Bible that defy logic. Logic doesn't make any sense at all. And they are foolish. When God told Abraham that Sarah was going to have a baby and Sarah overheard it, she laughed. She laughed because it was foolish. She's 90 years old. She's been barren all of her life. And the thought of having a baby at 90 is just absolutely foolish. But the foolishness of God is wiser than man. Can you imagine this scene? Here's Joshua. He is talking to his generals just before they're going to go into the city of Jericho and they want to know what his strategy is. And Joshua says, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have the armies march around the city of Jericho for seven days. And the generals said, yeah, that's good. That's a good idea because that will frighten the enemy. What then? He said, well, then on the seventh day, we're going to blow the trumpets and have the people shout. And the generals said, that's a great idea. That would motivate the army and that would frighten the enemy. Then what? And Joshua said, that's it. That's foolish. But the foolishness of God is wiser than man because at the shout of those people, the walls collapsed and the enemy was defeated. If you go through the Bible, I would challenge you to do it in any book. Go through the Bible, you will discover that one foolish thing after another foolish thing is brought to your attention and you cannot make heads or tails out. It doesn't make any logical sense at all. God is looking for a speaker, so he picks a stutterer. He tells Moses to go speak to Pharaoh and so Moses goes and said, let, 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 let b -b 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 people go. How foolish. But the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. Paul gets real personal. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And now he's talking to us. He said, God has chosen the foolish things. And now we're just not talking about foolish things out there in the Bible somewhere. We're talking about the foolish things. We are the foolish things. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. God, God does things. You know the very fact that we hear today I mean, who are we 
if God didn't decide he was going to choose the, the foolish and the weak, none of us would be here today. There's not many wise and not many noble and not many mighty. And, and yet God, God did something that the world considers foolish. Dwight L. Moody was a shoe salesman. And he became a preacher. But whenever he got excited, he stuttered. Possibly just like Moses. But people got saved. People were streaming to the altars during Dwight L. Moody's altar calls. And so he was invited to Cambridge University in England in order to speak to the student body. And the student body president was outraged by the fact that this Moody character, who, who murdered the king's English, would be invited to the center of English culture and speak to the student body. And so they decided they would organize a protest and boo him off stage. Dwight L. Moody gets up. This is what he says. Don't even think God don't love you because he do. <laughs> it shocked the student body. They didn't know what to do. And so he said it again. Don't think God don't love you because he do. <laughs> After the meeting, in a private setting, he led the student body president to the Lord because the foolish things of God are wiser than man. To try to understand and figure God out can't be done. So Paul writes this incredible statement. And when you think about it, you know, we, we are weak. And we're foolish. Have you ever done a foolish thing? Don't even raise your hand because if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to be worried about you. <laughs> We've done so many foolish things. That's why somebody decided to write these words. I am weak, but thou art strong. I am poor, but thou, God looked down and picked a poor boy under welfare wearing hand-me-down clothes to be a preacher. The foolish things of God are wiser than the wisdom of man. I am shy, but thou are strong. It's, it's just amazing now who God picks to do what, because I've asked myself, I'm, I'm 76 years old, I'm still asking myself, how could you possibly pick me to preach? <laughs> I don't get it. I am afraid, but thou art strong. We need a God to make up for the deficits that we find in our lives. Because when you think about it, we are not qualified. God does not pick the qualified. He picks people and then he qualifies them for service. If you just think about the disciples of Jesus, it's an amazing, it's an amazing illuminating thought. Peter, who was a loud mouth, unstable, liable to swear, is picked as a disciple. Could you imagine if, he, if they sent their resumes to a committee so they could imagine, you know, think about whether or not they were going to choose? They, they, they would never have picked Andrew. Andrew wasn't a leader type. James and John were hotheads and self-serving. And then you got Simon the Zealot who did not believe in paying taxes, and you got Matthew who was a tax collector. And they became disciples of Jesus. Of course, wait, there was one disciple who was educated, so his resume would look good. He was capable, he was bright, and he was good with money. He was Judas Iscariot. Nobody is qualified to do God's work until God steps in and qualifies them. The foolish things of God are wiser than the 
the wisdom of man. It, 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 just the thought of this, it, Jesus picked a donkey and a rooster. Isn't it, that foolish? Picking a donkey, a, a smelly donkey, the old gray mare ain't what she used to be, and then Jesus picked, it wasn't old, but he picked a donkey that had never been ridden on, and in order to, uh, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about that donkey. That's how, that's how incredible the foolishness of God is. And when the rooster crowed, it seemed foolish, but it sure did make a point, and it touched Peter's heart. And he realized what Jesus had told him was true. Because God can use anything to accomplish his will. And so that's why it's wonderful for us to get together again. Because God has used anything to build his church. Sometimes what we do is we think about ourselves as how God would use us. And we say, you know, hi, Lord, I don't know how you could use me. I make so many mistakes. I, 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 you know, I, I went left when I should have gone right. I made a bad decision when I should have made a good decision. I did this when I should have done that. And so I don't know how it is you could use somebody who's made so many mistakes. We've made mistakes. Everybody has. You have not been alive until you've made a mistake and you discover that you are Foolish and weak and vulnerable. And God takes the mistakes that we make, and that's what God uses to develop who we are. He takes, it's, it's amazing. You would think that God would take our strong points and all of the strong points God would create, and he takes the areas of our weakness. And it's difficult for us to accept it because, how, Lord, how can you take this mess up that I made and make something out of this? And that's exactly what God does. He takes things that, and he, he teaches us lessons from the mistakes that we made. We, we need to come to the place when we realize that because if we don't realize that, we will have a low opinion of ourselves all the rest of our lives. God will take me where I'm at. I, when I was about 12 years old, I, I bought a, a, a gasoline engine from a lawnmower from a f friend. And I didn't know anything about making a go-kart, but I figured you need, a go, you need an engine to have a go-kart. I have no mechanical ability at all, but I took this engine and brought it home, laid some paper out on the floor, and I started cleaning it up. I changed the spark plug, and I cleaned the carburetor, and I polished stuff up, and I tightened up the nuts and the bolts, and I came to one bolt, and I unscrewed it, and there was a lot of black gunk in it, and I emptied all of that out, and I put the, the, the bolt back in, and I had it all, all shiny and polished and and I got some gas, I put some gas in the engine, and I, I started up on a second or third try. It, it fired up, and, and, and in, in 10 seconds, it committed suicide. <laughs> I did not know that the black gunk that I poured out of it was oil. And a gasoline engine doesn't work good without oil. A mistake, and I never made that mistake again. We learn from mistakes. Mistakes have a way of, of speaking to us. They have a way of creating a guard and a boundary and reminding us, oh, I went that way. I'm not going that way anymore. I'm going to start going this way. Lord, help me. God takes the mistakes you know what really surprised me when I'm going through the scripture, the, th the thought that keeps occurring, I don't think I'll ever get a real answer for it, is this, that why does God go out of his way to do something foolish? He goes out of his way. The, the, the Syrian, Naaman, the Syrian captain comes to Elisha, and Elisha says, you have leprosy, and if you want to get rid of your leprosy, go to the muddy Jordan and dip into it seven times. He's insulted because it's totally illogical. But the foolish things of God are wiser than the things of man. God goes, and, and, and I don't have an answer for that, but I have, I, I'm nudged by some verses in Scripture to help me understand why God does foolish things, foolish to us, in order to accomplish his will. Jesus said this, I, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise 
and have revealed them unto babes. God hid this great revelation from those who were profoundly wise and revealed it to those who were profoundly young, children at heart. And I think if there's an answer to that, it's got to be at least this. The one thing about children is they believe. They believe. Children are born, they're ready to believe. You tell a child, Santa's coming to town. And they believe. Am I right? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's fairy tale. I know that's true. It's fairy tale. But Santa Claus is coming to town is something children believe. Now, we could laugh at the things that they believe, but just stop for a moment and think for a moment. What God is asking us to believe would make what children believe seem absolutely sensible. A virgin? Conceiving? A star? Guiding wise men, and 2,000 years later, scientists are still trying to figure out what kind of a star could they have possibly followed to lead them across the desert, and it stops over Bethlehem. They don't know. An angel suspended in midair, announcing to shepherds who are nobodies, announcing to them that the, the Christ child was born that night. The one thing about children is they will believe, and, and, and I know, I'm not talking about fairy tales. Let me give you an example about children believing. Carol Ann was a little girl, and she had a fever one night, and Nancy Ann told me to get up and get a baby aspirin and give it to Carol Ann. So I got up, and it's dark. I filled up a glass with water, and I took uh, two baby aspirins out of a bottle, and I brought it to Carol Ann, and I gave her the aspirins, and... She swallowed it with the water, and this is the thought I had when she was taking the aspirin. She didn't even ask me to see the bottle that it came from. She believed that what her dad was giving her was good and right because children innately have a need to believe. And we are the children of God. And we, if we're going to make it, we need to believe and trust like little children. And so the things that God tells us to believe are going to seem outlandish and foolish and hard to understand and impossible to logically figure out. But God wants us, and he's purposely saying things in foolish ways to us, so that he could get us to do what children find it so easy to do, and that's believe. We come here and gather together on Sunday morning and we worship uh, choruses that, 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 that lift up our spirits and draw us near to the Lord and worship, and he's invisible. And we believe he's here in a very spiritual and real way. We believe and we trust. Those are the people that God wants to use. Many times what we do is we come to the Lord and say, you know, I don't have anything to offer God. I, I got nothing. I mean, I got no talent that's worth talking about. And I, 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 I just don't, I don't. I wish I had something that God could use. I mean, because I see God using other people and they have wonderful talents. But, but I don't, Lord, I don't got anything. And they fail to realize that God doesn't need any of our things. The, the, the little boy that brought five loaves and two fish and didn't have much. Could you imagine sitting down with that boy? Let's say he was 12 years old, like I was when I bought that, that lawnmower engine. And, and sat down with the boy and, and he said, Did Jesus wants my lunch? Yeah, okay, I'll give it to him. What is he going to do with it? He's going to feed 5,000 people with it. Now, you know that boy would say that's foolish. But the foolish things of God are wiser than the wisdom of man. 
God can take the things. That this is a man, this is a man who, who picked up just little bits of screws and nuts and bolts and nails and wires and it, it, nothing, nothing, a little just stuff we would throw away. If we had this in our, in our garage, we probably wouldn't keep it. And, and he took it and he created a million dollar industry out of bits and pieces and people buy these things. He made them look like tractors, a little dog, a horse. And it amazes me to see this. He took bits of pieces, that's a fork. And if a man can take little bits of pieces and make something incredible with it, don't you think God can take the little bits and pieces that we have and make something incredible with us? He is a miracle working God. He created the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and he certainly can take us where we are with what we don't have, and he will make something out of us that will be astonishing. It's just a matter of I got to believe like a little child that God can do it. And God will. Do you believe that? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You've heard that song. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, take my feet, take, take me and what it is I have and what it is I don't. You know, you know that God doesn't even need things to make things out of. He makes things out of nothings. In the book of Genesis, when God said, let there be light, he made light out of nothing. It was total darkness. And out of total darkness, God said, let there be light. And out of nothing came light. Job says that he hung the earth on nothing. And all that is interesting from a scientific point of view. But when you get down this far, Paul writes, as I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. So to, to look what God did with Paul. Forget about us for a moment. Just look what God, God took a man who said there's nothing in me that is good and made something good out of something that he said was nothing. He made something beautiful of his life and that God can do the same with you and with me. We're ready to hang things up and say, well, I'm finished. I can't do anything anymore. There's nothing. Maybe my age is against me. My sickness is against me. This is against me. That's against me. Our education is against me. And we think that God is, is hamstrung by the limitations that we have seen. And God is not. God will take you where you are with what you have or don't have. He doesn't need what you don't have to make you what you need to be. How does God do that? How does, how does God take the foolish things and, and make, I want to tell you, this is the, one of the most foolish things you're going to find in the entire Bible. You can look from Genesis to, to Revelation and you will not find anything more foolish than this. This is how. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I don't understand that. Nobody understands that. The foolishness of preaching. This is just the foolishness of preaching. What, what the preacher has to say so many times is foolish because he's referring to a cross. What does the cross have to do with anything? It has everything to do with everything. That's what God says. The foolishness of God. It's wiser than the wisdom of man. And God picks something that, can, that is considered to be so foolish. I, I, I don't understand how it works, but he who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
I don't understand the mechanics of it. It's not important to understand the mechanics of it. Children don't understand how things fit together, but they, they dip, but they get to the place where they simply believe and trust. Look at this. Foolish. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The world will tell you that is foolish. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is nothing more foolish and yet nothing more powerful than the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we sing, oh, the blood of Jesus. Imagine, imagine the world trying to understand us singing, oh, the blood of Jesus. That's foolish. And it's the power of God and the salvation. There is forgiveness that we believe. There is forgiveness for those who are willing to confess. There is healing in the name of Jesus. God still answers prayer. Jesus was raised from the dead. We, we believe. We believe that the world considers foolish. And it goes on. Jesus is preparing a place. Could you imagine you tell, you're sitting at, you're in a party somewhere and you're talking about things, building houses, and you say, yeah, you know, Jesus is building me a mansion in heaven. And he's coming back for me to put me in that mansion. And it costs nothing. Jesus is coming back. The gates of hell cannot prevail against You know why the gates of hell cannot prevail against Because I, I, I want you to understand this. And I try to use a little logic in, 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 in trying to understand things that seem foolish. And it said is, when Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, I am part of the church. And I have failed many times. Haven't you? Fallen many times. But then God comes along and he says something to help qualify that statement. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church because after the battle is over, we will wear the crown. Some glad morning, when his life is o'er, I'll fly. <laughs> Try to explain that to the world. I'm going to fly away someday. How are you going to do that? Well, I don't know. Gravity's going to lose what it had. And it's just going to start floating up. And I'm going to meet a whole lot of people up in the air. And then we're going to go nonstop to heaven without refueling, without repair. We're going to go right to heaven. The world says, you're crazy. That's right. We're crazy. We're a little nuts, but that's what holds us together. And we're cracked. And that's where the light shines through so we can see where it is we're going. We believe. Call us children. Call us whatever you want. We believe. We believe what God said. And God has asked us to believe so many foolish things. I mean, when he told Mary, you're going to have a baby, how can this be, she said. Because it seemed foolish. We believe. If there's anything that characterizes the Christian, it's that statement. We believe. Jesus, he's our hope. You're going through a storm, he's your hope. Trouble surrounds you, he's your hope. Confusion, he's your hope. Sickness, he's your hope. Don't know what's coming next, he's your hope. You feel like you're hemmed in in a cul-de-sac and there's no way to turn. 
He's your hope. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. And as little children, we come into his presence and say, Lord, I don't even understand. I do understand. I want to understand one thing. Jesus is the hope of glory. That somehow you're going to get me through this. Somehow I'll make it through another day. Somehow I'll make it through the night. Weeping may endure at night, but a joy is going to come in the morning. I don't know how you're going to do it, and I didn't even know if I could make it to the morning, but Jesus, you're the light of the world. You're the sun, the bright and morning star. There is a morning coming for me. I, I'm in the middle of this darkness, but there is light coming. I've got to believe in what you said. It sounds so foolish. It doesn't matter. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. I'm going with Jesus. I'm going to trust him anyway. I'm going to hold on to him anyway. Living here, 